Okay, cool. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Heather Ellsworth. I work at Canonical, and I'm here with some other Canonicalers. Um, and we're just going to kind of talk a little bit about some new stuff. Maybe you've heard that we have a new release, uh, Lunar Lobster. It's 2304. Um, and so we would like to tell you a little bit about some of the new stuff that, that we have. Um, so here, here's, so we have Till, uh, Dennis, and Jeremy kind of all representing different areas of the, uh, of Ubuntu. So, um, it's a nice diverse panel for you on various topics. Um, so I'll just kind of pass the microphone down and then Till, do you want to talk a little bit about what's new in printing land? Yes. Cause Till is definitely like the printing guru. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm Till Kampeter. I'm uh, the leader of the Open Printing Project. This already since uh, 2001, uh, so 22 years for now. And so also in Ubuntu, I'm responsible for the printing part, as one could already think. And in generally, I do everything f to make printing just work on nearly any operating system platform, mainly the, mainly the POSIX style operating systems like Linux. And I, and uh, in Ubuntu, in, Lu in uh, Luna Lobster 23.04, there are also some new things and it's, because it's, it's on the way to get a new printi printing architecture, which will be completely available from uh, Ubuntu 24.04 LTS on in one year from now, is we want to make the printing architecture more modern. The current printing architecture is working very well, but it is based on technologies which are more than 20 years old which come from the time when, when, uh, li when Unix was used in, com in computing centers and all the printers were either simple text or postscript. And so uh, printing worked all by postscript and one uses postscript printer description files to describe the properties of printers. And already t more than 10 years ago, we have switched to PDF as the standard data for format for print jobs. So using PostScript printer uh, description files is a little bit strange for describing printer properties. And also modern printers, they are IPP printers and they tell the properties by themselves and do not even need drivers therefore. And therefore we are modernizing the printing architecture, making all IPP. And so we have to do a lot of changes in the printing software. And in the 23.04, we have added the first step. It's a new CUPS filters package. So the package which contains the print filters, which convert the input format, usually PDF, into the printer's native format, is adapted to the new architecture and on this this is not a user-facing thing in Ubuntu 23.04, but d in the course of this work, we fixed a lot of bugs. We found out that some uh, options for and, and settings for printing actually did not work. And so this was all cleaned out and intensely tested. And also uh, the CUPS filters package got uh, uh, got build tests and auto package tests and so on tests which are run when the packages are downloaded. So we have a much better quality of the print filters now. So the user will see that many bugs gets got, got fixed in, in terms of printing and the print filters. And this is what we have in 23.04. We will also be uh, able to test more of the new architecture as I have also created a PPA with more software which did not make it before feature freeze so that one can already test more of the new printing architecture by my PPA. I will talk more about this today at 4.35 in this room and give a demo of the changes on the printing GUI. And 
in 23.10, so the next release after this one, in half a year from now, we will already switch over to the new printing architecture by, you, by not using uh, uh, the CUPS Debian packages anymore, but the, cu but the CUPS Snap. I've snapped CUPS. I've snapped printer drivers also in the, t in, in the form of printer applications. These are emulations of IPP printers, and this we already have in the this we have already in the Snap Store. And in 23.10 we will all have all this. And this also allows to make a Linux distribution, which is all Snap, which has no Debian packages anymore. Yes, 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 yes. So this is uh, the news, and now we get a little bit more fluttering. Thank you, Till. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Dennis. Uh, I'm quite new still to Ubuntu and the, the open source software world in general. I joined the team last fall, and I mainly work on Flutter applications. And if you've installed the new release, the first thing you have encountered is probably the new installer, which, to my knowledge, is the first uh, Flutter application that is shipped by default uh, by Ubuntu. And I've contributed a bit to this in the past month, uh, although the main work was done by more experienced developers than me. Um, but uh, there will be lots, uh, a lot of uh, future applications uh, that will be included by default, I hope, uh, in the next few releases, uh, which are all Flutter-based. And the interesting thing about this is that uh, just starting to work on these projects has had a lot of side effects in the sense that we implemented a lot of libraries desktop portals, debug interfaces uh, in Dart uh, that can be used by anyone who wants to write Flutter applications for the Linux desktop. So uh, in this way, we want to encourage people that uh, write platform independent applications uh, to also consider publishing them on, on Linux. And especially for Ubuntu, uh, it integrates quite well now with everything that I just mentioned, just the functionality of the desktop as well as the theme, because in Ubuntu we have our own kind of community-driven theme called Yaru, uh, for which there's been a lot of work going on to make uh, a Flutter application integrate seamlessly into the look and feel of, of Ubuntu. And uh, yes, um, yeah, there's some, some more projects that maybe Till can tell you about, because I don't know them so well. Anyways, uh, the other point I wanted to make is that um, we also, or the other major project you might have heard of is uh, the new Snap Store, which is uh, in development. And uh, this is a completely community-driven project, which Canonical has uh, started to collaborate uh, uh, with the community on it. And this will be uh, the next focus, let's say. And uh, people are already quite interested in it and, and have the feeling that it performs much better than the current uh, store we're shipping by default. So this is something to look forward to and a lot of work will go into this and we hope to, to finish it as far as I know uh, for the next release and we'll see how, how well that goes. All right. Hi, uh, I'm my name is Jeremy Bika uh, and I work on traditional packaging. Uh, for um, no maps for Debian and Ubuntu. Uh, so in the new Ubuntu release, we have GNOME 44. Um, GNOME 44 feels like a bit of a quieter release after, after the last few releases. Um, in GNOME 42 and 43, many of the core apps were switched to GTK4 from GTK3. Um, and in this release, there were refinements made. Um, Nautilus in particular has, has several improvements after it switched to GTK4 in the previous release. Um, um, one app, um, Epiphany, um, GNOME's web browser, has switched to GTK4 in this release, so that's an, that's an improvement. Um, another area of refinement is in GNOME 43, uh, there's a new, um, the, the system status area in the top right of GNOME shell has, um, has a lot of quick settings buttons now um, those have been uh, refined and approved. Um, the quick settings have subtitles um, explaining what they're doing, and Bluetooth is now um, a quick settings button, so you can easily turn on and off different uh, Bluetooth devices. 
Um, since I work on Debian also, uh, Debian will be coming out with their new stable release uh, sometime in the next next couple months, and it's shipping GNOME 43. Um, I, I also want to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing. Um, it's kind of behind the scenes to improve the Snap experience. Is, um, as our Snaps grow in the Snap Store, um, we care a lot about the Snaps, and it takes a lot of effort to maintain them and test them and build new releases when there's a new upstream tag or what have you. Um, so I've been working on uh, writing some GitHub actions and workflows to kind of automate the process, which is, has been a lot of fun, a uh, very exciting learning experience for me. So basically, in GitHub, you'll find under the Ubuntu organization many uh, snaps, repos, and um, there's a centralized action that will automatically um, build um, it, it check and see if there's a new release upstream. If there is, then go ahead and automatically change the Snapcraft YAML to have that new tag, and then automatically open up a pull request uh, with that, and then build the Snap. Um, that's where we're at right now. We want to take it even further, um, because automation is wonderful and a lot of fun. Um, we want to... Uh, so if, if that pull request looks good, if it builds well, then as soon as we merge it, it automatically goes to Launchpad to build and upload to the Snap Store. Um, so we're really trying to improve the automation experience um, for Snaps so that we can deliver those new releases faster uh, in a more automated fashion. Um, yeah, yeah, I, th I think this is, this is a good release. Um, and you know, as Dennis mentioned, there is the new Snap Store. Um, you can go and install it if you like. Um, some other things that are are cool are we have uh, a Steam Snap that you may have heard about. I talked about that last loss, um, but it is in the stable repo now. So if you do Snap install Steam, um, then you can, you know, play all kinds of games like, uh, you know. Windows games <laughs> on your Linux desktop. That's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's a good release, um, and we look forward to the next couple of releases. Uh, more exciting things. Um, is there anything else you guys want to add? <laughs> Um, well, I, I'm excited to be back here in, in Brno. Um, this is my second time to the Czech Republic. Uh, we were here six months ago uh, for the Ubuntu Summit. Um, that was super exciting. Um, I've been involved in the Ubuntu community for, for many years, so I was around for the old Ubuntu Developer Summits, um, and so that was a great opportunity to go to those. So I'm, I'm super happy that they've come back. Um, I think it's great for the community, great for people to um, to meet each other and to get inspired. Um, I, I feel like um, s since we stopped doing the summits, there's been, there's been less community involvement in helping make Ubuntu better. Um, personally, um, going to the Ubuntu summits was part of how I got involved. I was able to meet people and get inspired and know who to talk to for next steps on how to contribute more. Since you went to the old Ubuntu summits, what would you say uh, it was your experience difference uh, with this, the new revamped Ubuntu summit versus the old Ubuntu developer summit? Well, the, the new Ubuntu summit is new, and I think that was good. They, they didn't, they didn't c when they were organizing it, they didn't set out to make an exact copy of the old Ubuntu developer summit. Um, it allows to experiment with new ideas. Um, the old one was was a whole week long event, and it was doing a lot of planning for the next Ubuntu release. Um, the new one is, uh, and it was, and it seemed to be more driven from from Canonical side. And the new Ubuntu Summit is more more interested in what the community is working on, 
and it's a shorter event, which, which I think is, is helpful too. And, um, and it's, it's, not, it's not so much um, kind of roadmap planning, what are we going to be working on? It's more, what have we done and what are we looking forward to doing next? Yes, it's more or less this way. Currently, we have at first we have one week of an internal meeting, or even two weeks of canonical internal meetings, where we where canonical employees and managers do the actual planning for the next release. And the Ubuntu summit, there, it, it's more one has presentations of of different free software pro projects related to Ubuntu, showing off what you can do with Ubuntu, what is new in Ubuntu, and you can even learn things on the Ubuntu Summit. On the first one, we had a nice uh, snap tutorial track. We have run five workshops to learn how to snap applications. and. Uh, there were also other workshops. You uh, you you could uh, learn about robotics, about building a plotter, and about a, of a lot of things. Two hour, uh, uh, ninety minutes interactive workshops, and then we had na naturally a lot of talks from the community, from uh, also but also from some from canonical employees and so, and this was more or less this uh, this event. Where the Ubuntu Developer Summit, we did not have the canonical internal sprints. We had only the Ubuntu Developer Summit, and the I Ubuntu Developer Summit was simply boffs, bird of the feather sessions, pl planning sessions where pe small groups of people meet and discuss things. There were no talks given, no workshops, and so on. So it was completely different. And, and all of those videos are available if you go to the Ubuntu On Air um, channel of YouTube. You can find the Ubuntu Summit videos and catch up if you weren't able to make it or if maybe there's an interesting talk that you want to rewatch. Um, yeah, very similar to LAO. But one thing is the videos are only the talks, not the workshops. Don't think yet, now I go to Ubuntu On Air and learn snapping. The workshops, un unfortunately, because they were highly interactive, the people were doing exercises on their own laptops. We could not, uh, we could not uh, record. This had not made sense. And we'll have another Ubuntu summit uh, this fall as well. We don't have like final dates or location yet, but that information will be coming. Um. So, uh, so Canonical's hiring, um, and uh, I was wondering if, if Heather, if you might want to talk a little bit about um, the interviewing process. And um, uh, Heather, Heather's been doing a lot of interviewing on on the desktop team for us, and so I thought she might have. Um, yeah, so we are definitely hiring, as Igor mentioned in the opening uh, talk. If yeah, um, I have done so many interviews <laughs> um, uh, for like we are still hiring for community engineers. Um, I think we I'm not actually sure what the roles available still on the desktop team are, but all over the company. Um, all the teams have headcount, uh, so if you are interested in coming to work at Canonical, please consider applying. The interview process is kind of long, um, but that's just because we want to make sure that we get the you know the best people that are you know not just looking for a job but actually you know enjoy working on open source and, and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, once you submit your application, and I, I think you you know have to take some evaluation online and and then you know get through some automated process but after that then there's like a, a meet and greet which is the initial video interview um, that's not technical uh, it's really just like a, a way for the interviewer to give information about what the culture is like at canonical and answer any questions the interviewee has um, 
those are mostly what I do. I think they put me in front as the initial person because I'm the social butterfly, and uh, so that works. <laughs> um, kind of gets the jitters out too, so that that's that's nice. Um, and then you know, it, we fill out like our there's like a little scorecard where we you know recommend moving forward and add any notes that we have. And then there's like there's technical interviews, and depending on the role, it. it you know, varies on like how many interviews or what the topics are, who you interview with. But generally, like you interview with, you know, obviously the hiring lead, the manager, um, typically another manager from outside of that team, um, and an HR, and maybe like a security person. Um, but I'm, you know, it's a long process that I I do think is worth it. Um, I do love my job. One really cool thing about working at Canonical that I've never experienced before is that people legitimately care about what they work on. And so even after they leave, you know, it's still kind of like a family and they are still Ubuntu developers. Um, they're still part of that community. Um, so it's, uh, it's really nice to work with people that are sincere about um, their passion on what they work on. Yeah. So to add to this, uh, since I'm at least of the people uh, sitting here, the newest uh, employee, uh, having gone through this process uh, a bit more than half a year ago, and I have definitely seen before that on like social media, be it like Hacker News or wherever, uh, a lot of people complain about the, the lengthy process and that it's a kind of a hard process. And I can definitely, I feel the same to a certain degree. And uh, I personally, if, if I was in charge of, of like hiring people, I would probably do a different approach. But I can see that this is also necessary just because there's this huge amount of applications and then there needs to be some sort of selection process before. But as, as Heather said, once you kind of break through the initial barrier, uh, I found that the, all the interviews I had were incredibly nice in, in the best possible way. It felt just not really like an interview at some point, more like a, a friendly chat among people who are interested in the same subject. Maybe that was because uh, I am interested in these things and I felt like I, I fit in here very well and this is why it felt very easy for me. Uh, in, in contrast to that, I applied to other jobs before in my life, like to insurance companies and stuff like this, where I always felt a bit out of place. Here I was felt, uh, I, I was made to feel very much at home and very welcomed and I had a great experience, as I said, after the initial barrier which took me a bit of uh, effort to, to get over. But what I actually want to talk about, uh, in like once you go through the interview process and if you're lucky enough and, and make it and uh, are welcome to the company, the onboarding process that I experienced was uh, interesting to say to a certain degree because it's supposed to be quite organized and, and whatnot, but I joined at a time where it was close to the previous release, so a lot of people were already, already very busy. But despite all that, uh, I felt like uh, the onboarding process was, was done very well because uh, I immediately had uh, like a mentor, like a, a developer that is much more experienced than me and could give me tasks and uh, a lot of feedback to everything that I did. I always felt like I could reach out to any of the managers or any of the people uh, working with me, ask them questions at basically any, any time of the day they were available. And to me what is most important in a job is uh, having the freedom to do your own thing, to do your own work in the way that you work best. A lot of people work differently than me, they need a lot of guidance and structure. I sometimes like to do things on my own and then come back with questions and I feel like in the company you, you can really decide on how you want to work and uh, find a common ground somewhere and yeah, you're treated kind of uh, as an equal to a certain degree. And yeah, that's, that's just my, my initial experience. As I said, I've been there now for seven or maybe even eight months and uh, it's been a really great time. Uh, just also as Jeremy just said, uh, I have not obviously been to the previous Ubuntu Developer Summits, but I was lucky enough to uh, attend the Ubuntu Summit last last fall. 
And uh, this also was a great experience in terms of not only meeting all my, my colleagues for the first time in, in person, like in the, in the internal events before, but then immediately being thrown into the actual community and meeting people who just volunteer for Ubuntu or maybe work in other companies and, and collaborate and, and these kind of things. And I think this is a very valuable and unique thing uh, which you don't really have in the uh, in the outside world, let's say, where you don't work on open source software, but it's proprietary software, whatever. Uh, it's it's a really nice experience for somebody who, who is new to this whole experience because um, everyone I've met is very friendly. They, rather than compete with you, try to collaborate with you and, and uh, find new ideas and new projects to work on. So just to advertise it again, uh, the Ubuntu Summit, if it happens in fall, I guess it does, uh, once you figure out where and when, uh, it's a great place to be, great place to meet new people and get involved in, in open source software. Do you have an idea? Um, so you, you mentioned that uh, it, was, it was nice to be able to meet your colleagues. So um, I think it would be good if we talked about where, where we live, where we're from, because we're all from different places. So, so um, I live in Florida, in the United States. Yeah, for me it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm originally from Germany, as you might be able to tell by my accent. Uh, I, have, I have lived in Italy for quite a while. While I was in the application process, I still lived in Italy. Moved back to Germany for some time, currently staying part-time in Italy, part-time in Germany. And just to highlight this, this is a great thing about working remotely 100% of the time. You can choose where you live uh, once you figure out all the paperwork involved. And I think Till has some, some similar stories to tell. <laughs> yes, yes. I, am, I, I can now beat him. We are <laughs> ramping up here. And I have made it to five countries in my life. I'm German. And after my PhD, where I was system administrator also, I, I've done a PhD in theoretical physics, and I was system administrator. This I had to set up Linux machines there. This brought me into free software. So my first job after the PhD, my PhD was something about two-dimensional ma magnetic materials, but after that, I switched into uh, into uh, structured deposition of ink and toner particles on paper substrates at Mendoexoft in Paris. And in 2006, I switched to Canonical. And from, uh, from 2006 on until now, I lived at first in, in Portugal, because my wife had a postdoc there. Then we moved to Berlin. And then there was some, uh, then uh, my wife's father was not so well, and so we moved to, pa to, to Brazil, to, to uh, my wife's parents. And then three years later, we moved to Vienna, two hours from here. And working at Canonical, it's really no problem. I simply continued my work all the time. And... So open printing worked from everywhere. <laughs> and so no worries. And currently, I'm living in Vienna. But in winter, for two months, December and January, I live in, in Brazil. And work is no problem. One works from home. One can work from everywhere. But and on the other side, it's also People who want to work at Canonical can live everywhere, can apply wherever they live. Perhaps this also leads to have many candidates because people are applying from all over the world. And yes, that's Canonical. Yeah, I, I live in Colorado, but I love that I can travel anywhere, go see my dad in Puerto Rico and hang out and, and still work. The flexible hours are really cool. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's great that um, we have such a diverse workforce. Um, I mean, the field is still very male dominated, which is something on top of my mind as a female. But um, at least it's a very diverse workforce. Lots of different cultures and experiences, and everybody is genuinely nice and uh, inclusive. Um, I do appreciate that the company um, has diversity and inclusion in their mind. 
and are actively looking for specifically like women um, and, and minorities. I, they recognize that diversity improves our products, improves our interoperability, um, and not all companies have that kind of mindset. I really value that ours does. Um, having more women in tech is a bit of a problem, and we don't have it. We, we don't have as much as we need because we don't already have more mo women in tech. It's like a circular issue. So <laughs> um, I really hope to see that improve, not just in Canonical, but like across the, the tech spectrum um, in, the, in the next decade or so. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a really good company to work for. Um, Oh, one really cool thing about uh, Canonical is we have these resource groups. So that I'm part of the women's resource group. There's also like a LGBTQ resource group, a working parents resource group. Each, each group gets like a budget to spend how they want to further their initiative. So we get to, so the women's resource group is probably the most active. And we um, get speakers to come in and talk about diversity and inclusion or, you know, um, you know, quieting those negative self-talk things that we often do. Um, I don't know, just kind of improving our experience. Um, talk about imposter syndrome, right? How that's rampant. Um, we do book clubs. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's, it's really nice to kind of have that budget. Here you go, spend this on the initiatives that you think will further, uh, further that group. Um, that's really cool. And then also, as they kind of mentioned, you know, we all work remotely, most of the company does, even though there are a handful of offices around the world. Um, but with that comes the really importance of face-to-face uh, -face time. So we get together twice a year for these sprints, even though that's like an overloaded term, right? It really just means like an internal conference where we just like take over a hotel somewhere in the world. Um, and that that's that's really nice. You know, we have it kind of brings the team together in a bonding way. We have we play board games together and have lots of beer together. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's it's a really good time. Um, this is the best team I've ever been on. Um, even though the last company I worked at that was also a very good team, but like my boss is probably the best boss I've ever had. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> Ken Van Dyne is like he's pretty fabulous. Um, but but the team in general, uh, the company in general, it's it's great. A every company has its like pitfalls, right? Like you know, team various teams could communicate a little bit better, but we're working on that, right? No no company's perfect. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. Also, another thing about Canonical is there are a lot of people that have been there for a really long time and are still legitimately happy. Till is one example. <laughs> <laughs> You've been here like, what, 17 years? You said uh, 2006, um, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Since 2000. Since 2006, I'm at Canonical, so I'm really one, one of the near first uh, people. It was founded in 2004 by Mark Shuttleworth, but I was really still in the pioneer time because I did not get to this length, lengthy hiring process. It was in 2001 to 2006, I was organizing every year a printing booth on the Linux Tag in Germany. This was the biggest Linux show in Europe in that time. And this was a community booth. And in 2006, I bumped into Mark Shuttleworth. And Mark Shuttleworth right away invited me to work at Canonical. And s some days later, I got an email uh, the next Ubuntu Developer Summit, the one of mid-2006, was in Paris. And I was living in Paris. I was still at Mendo Exoft. And so I was taking a day off, taking the shuttle, the, uh, taking the train to the airport, the shuttle bus of the hotel, and then I was on a Ubuntu Developer Summit, and then I was talking with my future boss and with my future mentor. And 
then I was one of the canonical people. And this was the end of my, of my, uh, my part in Paris, my six years in Paris. Please do not speak French to me. And <laughs> I could move on. <laughs> <laughs> Je ne comprends pas. <laughs> tu, parles mou, mou, uh, tu parles très bien français. <laughs> yes, Ke Kenny, I, I hope you can edit the, t the subtitles in so that the people who are watching the recording, that they will... Uh, understand all of it. Yes, there's also a nice thing when we have the engineering sprints every half year. The de every team has a team room. They are working together for one week in one meeting room of a huge hotel. And in the desk, then the desktop team has a lot of French people. It has currently three. It had four in the high uh, at the highest, and. These French people are always talking French with each other. And when they were talking French with each other, there was another, Bra there was also a Brazilian colleague. And then I simply started to speak Portuguese with a Brazilian colleague. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we have more Brazilian colleagues. Then I started counting the number of Portuguese speaking uh, desktop team members and French speaking desktop team members. And now we Portuguese desktop team members have won. We have more people speaking Portuguese in the desktop team than French. <laughs> yeah. Is, isso é realmente o trabalho perfeito. <laughs> Eu amo este trabalho. I love my job. <laughs> J'aime mon travail. <laughs> Ach, ich bin ja Deutscher. Ich liebe meinen Job. <laughs> I, I, I think we should pretty much wrap this up. Uh, maybe go get a bite before the other sessions start. So I, I don't know. I hope people watching online found this useful um, and consider applying if you are looking for a job. So thanks a lot. And yeah, cheers. <laughs>